certainly bid everyone a good morning. You take your Bibles, you would turn to the 12th Psalm. That's where we'll be in our lesson this morning. I understand we had one of the Psalms in uh, Sunday school this morning, and we'll have one of the Psalms in for the lesson today. The gospel meetings in this area, I did get the list of them. Here they are. Leone, Wood, Bobby, Bonner, Shady Grove, Morrison, and Keltenburg. All this is going to be on April the 8th. So there's a lot of gospel meetings. Now, it is wonderful. I think it is a blessing to be in an area where there's so many congregations and so many that work together and are in fellowship with one another. And so we really hope for the success of all of these meetings. And so I like to say that when there's meetings pile up on one another like that, that it's not competition. This is teamwork, okay? And I would, wish almost we could get a count of everyone at every service night and pull that count together for how many was at the gospel meeting. It's almost like having an area-wide gospel meeting spread out all over the area. The Shady Grove meeting will be a little different. That's on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then the others are going to be Sunday through Wednesday or Sunday through Thursday. But you certainly have your choice. And I would encourage you to take advantage of that. I tell you, if you've lived where I have, where the churches were far apart, and even then the relationships weren't all that good, and then you come to an area like this where there's so many, and the relationships are so good, and there's such good fellowship, that it is just a feast and a joy. And maybe if you've always kind of been used to that, you don't realize what a blessing that is. But you just might make it a point. I'm going to go to as many gospel meetings as I can and just kind of work that into what, what you do and uh, take advantage of that. And you'll find some of the finest people in the world. And as you visit other places, what you're doing, you're getting to know some folks that, that you're going to get to spend eternity with. Now, that's one reason to try to go and to be part of that. Now, this is a special... Sunday, at least culturally, and it's always uh, fun, or it's always just a joy, I say more than fun, a joy to go to worship on what we call here in America Easter Sunday, and it's not just Easter Sunday in America, I mean people celebrate, they, they make a special Sunday out of Easter all over the world, and that is really amazing. There's some precedent for that, it goes back to to what the Jews did. The Jews had a religious calendar. There would be some days and some weeks throughout the year that were special days and, and elevated above other days. That'd be the Passover and Pentecost and the Day of Atonement. And, and then there would be other days throughout the year. But when Christianity came in, everything associated with Judaism and the old law as we've been talking about on Sunday night. You know, that was done away. And so now every first day of the week is the, the special day of the week. And that's what we try to remember. And a lot of times in the churches of Christ, people wonder, well, why don't you celebrate all these special days and all? Well, the, the reason is, the whole idea is we want to be like the New Testament church. And there was no emphasis on special Sundays in the New Testament church. Every Sunday was a special day of the week in the New Testament church. And so these other days, they're just not as important to us. And that's what we're trying to do. They're not as important to us as they are with other people. But I tell you what, they are culturally recognized days, aren't they? And, and we enjoy those days. We'll have Christmas and Easter and Mother's Day and Fourth of July and Thanksgiving, and we enjoy all those days in a cultural way. But we don't try to set a special religious significance on them that, that the Bible doesn't place. Easter's a little different than that. Now, it's like those cultural days. That's true, but the Jews would keep the Passover. 
Now, the, the Passover was not a date on a calendar, so it always fall on that day of the month every year. It, the, the Passover, the priest would watch the heavens, and by following the Old Testament, the Passover was always that week of a full moon. It would be following the times when after spring had begun. And so we've got a little shortcut way of remembering when Easter Sunday is. It is the first Sunday after the first full moon following the spring equinox. And that's why Easter kind of kind of moves around. It's following the, the Jewish Passover that, that moved around in the year. And like we say in the New Testament, it was another first day of the week. And so sometimes we maybe almost pass by it without much notice religiously in the church. But certainly like other cultural days, we recognize the cultural significance that that's had for us and a good time for families to get together, good time to hunt Easter eggs, and I, I think it is good when anything can remind people of our Lord. And so today, many places, the emphasis is on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you think about it, Jesus rose early on the morning of the first day of every week, or the first day of the week. And that set the precedent for us to worship our God on the first day of every week. Now I'm going into that to explain I don't really have a special Easter sermon this morning. And it's because that we don't put that much emphasis on it, although I'm not opposed to preaching on the resurrection on any day uh, of the year, really. So, But we're trying to study the Psalms on the first Sunday of every month. Here uh, And so we've come to the 12th Psalm, so I thought I'd continue that. And I invite you to turn to the 12th Psalm now, and we'll get on into the sermon. And I would title this Psalm, really by the lesson that is taught, Beware the Words of Men, and Believe the Word of God. Now that's the lesson from this psalm. Let's read the psalm. Psalm 12. To the chief musician upon Shemineth, a psalm of David. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, With our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, forever. Preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Psalm ends kind of rough, doesn't it? The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Here, this began Psalm 12. Let's look at this inscription to the psalm. That's those little words that occur just before the, the body of the psalm itself. And some say that's not really part of the psalm, but, but otherwise... They're as old as the oldest copies we have of those psalms. And this is to the chief musician. That reminds us that when we're looking at the psalms, we're working at compositions that were intended to be sung. 
And so they're so, it's poetic work is what we're looking at. And so we'll read them and interpret them the way we would poetry. And then it has this strange word, upon Simoneth. Well, that word is usually not translated. But a lot of the modern Bibles and everyone trying to come up with a little different ways to present the text, some, some may translate that. If they do, then it would be translated upon the eighth. Well, that doesn't help a lot, does it? The eighth what? Well, some would say, well, that must have been an eight-stringed instrument. Someone says, well, that must have been eight people in the, in the choir. <laughs> some says, well, maybe it's the eighth note. Or some say, maybe it's the eighth tune in the book. Well, the thing is, you don't really know what that means. You know, there's some parts of the Bible that's such an ancient book that some things have faded off into the mist of the darkness of the ancient past, and we're not sure exactly what that means. But don't let that worry you. Everything we need to know is clear in the scriptures. While this old word reminds us that these old psalms are very old, we don't have to worry sometimes about things like that that we can't really peer into. If it was necessary for us to know it, God would see to it that it was preserved to our day so we would know it. But it does tell us this. It is a psalm of David. Now, David's often called the sweet singer of Israel. You remember when Saul was troubled in his spirit, he would send for that shepherd boy to come play his harp for him and to sing songs to him to soothe his nerves and to give him peace in his soul. And when you look at the psalms and you read them, you start thinking about David's life and wonder how would these psalms fit into the, the life of David? And sometimes we don't really know. But I know this. David had trouble with getting men to tell him the truth. And there were always those trying to deceive him. And there was a time when David was fleeing from Saul in the wilderness. David had a chance to kill Saul. And he let that chance go. And he got far away from Saul and he held up part of Saul, either part of his garment or, the, or his water or his spear or something like that. said, Saul, Saul, look, I could have killed you, but I let you go. When Saul saw David do that, he told David, no, David, you're being more righteous than I. I will pursue you no more. But Saul didn't keep his word. And before long, Saul was out trying to chase David down again. Well, the words of men are like that. Sometimes men will just tell you things and they'll, they'll just promise you all up and down. <clears throat> they don't mean it. You have to beware the words of men. Now, in the time of this psalm, <clears throat> David begins the first verse and the and the last verse sort of fit together. Help, Lord. David's trying, crying out for help. Why? The godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. You know, sometimes you do look around and say, where'd all the good folks go? It seems like there ought to be more good people in this world than there are. You remember Loretta Lynn singing that song, they don't make them like my daddy anymore. The, the, just the good men are gone. I guess they uh, uh, broke the mold or they threw away the key or something in a great big land of freedom at a time we really need them. They don't make them like my daddy anymore. You know, Elijah felt that way one time. He felt like he was the only one righteous in Israel and he fled away and was so depressed about that. And, and David sort of is being this way now. The good men... They cease. The faithful men, those you can count on, now they fail. What is the world coming to? If you take the good men out of the world, what's going to happen to the world? Now we're called to be the good people of the world. The salt of the earth. The light of the world. 
We'd make the world a better place, can't we? By, by who we are. But then that last verse, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Boy, I best about have to quit watching the, the news and the TV. You know, think who they exalt on the, in the media. They'll exalt sports figures and they'll exalt Hollywood stars and they'll exalt politicians. But then you start looking at their personal lives and you think, oh my, these are, are really dis despicable people. And if they're held up to be great, some role model or something, no wonder. But when we uphold ungodly men and functions and like that, then others get to think, well, I'd be that way too. And so the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Now, that's how the psalm begins and how it ends. But there's some good meat and message for us throughout the body of this psalm. And I want to start off reminding us now, beware the words of men. Number one, because they speak vanity. Vanity means emptiness. They're out there saying things, but they're saying nothing. There's no meaning to their words. They'll tickle your ears with their words. They'll say maybe what you want to hear, but you can't count on what they're saying. It talks about it in 2 Peter 2, 17 and 18, and there are several things Peter says that sort of reflects back on this psalm, but in the New Testament... He says, these are wells without water. You know what a well without water is? It's empty. That's what it is. You go there expecting to get water and expecting to get refreshment. Nothing in there but dust. It looks like a well, but it doesn't satisfy. The clouds that are carried with the tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. We've gone through those periods where it hadn't rained a while. And then you see these clouds on the horizon. Oh boy, maybe it'll rain and the wind blows and the cloud comes and passes and leaves and goes and you don't have any rain. That's the way these people are that speak vain words. It looks like we're going to get something out of this. And they leave you with nothing. It says when they speak great swelling words of vanity. You know, I'm always kind of listen close when people start using great big words. When they really try to impress you with the language that they're using, just give me plain talk. Because sometimes people can use big words that carry very little or no meaning and they mask the fact that they're not saying anything by the, the eloquent words that they use. Well, they speak great swelling words of vanity and they are lured through ugly things, through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness and those that were clean escape from them who live in error. So beware the words of men. They just might be empty words. Beware the words of men because they'll flatter you. They speak with flattering lips. Now, compliments are nice things. I enjoy compliments and most of the time when I'm through, people will walk out the door and tell me I really appreciated what you had to say. One time Bradley was up here preaching and when he got through, I stood at the back door and one of the ladies went out and said to me, I really appreciate what you had to say. Well, I didn't say it. But, so sometimes people get into, get into the habit of just complimenting and I know they're meaning that to encourage me, and I appreciate that, but flattery is different than a compliment. When you're flattering someone, you're trying to manipulate them. You see, people like to hear nice things about themselves, and uh, flatterers know that. So they flatter to get you off guard. Remember when they came to Jesus tempting him, and they started out and said, Good master, good master trying to flatter him and what they then ask is a trick question should we render unto to, uh, Caesar or not should we pay our taxes he's trying to get him tricked up on a trick question 
Well, flattery will do that. Beware of men. It says in Proverbs 20 and verse 19, meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Proverbs 29, 5, a man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. He's trying to catch him off guard, see? It says in 2 Peter 2, in verse 3, back to Peter now, through covetousness, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Those feigned words, they're just pretending. They're trying to take advantage of you. And so they will flatter you before they take you. Now beware the words of men. They speak with a double heart. With a double heart do they speak. You know, yeah, sometimes it comes across kind of hard at you when people just tell you the truth just flat out. But yet there's something refreshing about that too. People that will say what they mean and will mean what they say. But there are those that they don't say what they mean. They don't mean what they say. I remember the Lone Ranger. You remember the... the, the did any of y'all ever watch the little... Did you ever watch the Lone Ranger? Yeah. Oh, you got to see that, the masked man with the white hat that would come in and save the day. He had a... His, his little sidekick was Tonto, the Indian. And I remember what Tonto would say to the Lone Ranger. Man speak with forked tongue. That's why Hollywood Indians... I don't know if any Indian ever said that, but in Hollywood, the Indians would say, men speak with forked tongue. That means they got a double meaning here because they got a double heart and they're trying to deceive you. Beware the words of men. Now they'll speak proud things. Oh, the, the tongue is a little member that boasts some great things, James said. And men like to say things like, well, I'd never do that. Or we would always do this. And they act so proud and so big and, the, and they will actually, in their words, they will deny God proudly. But beware those words. Here's how they do. They, they say with their, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Nobody's going to tell me what I can and cannot say. And they won't even let the Lord do that. And so that little member, you know, it's an unruly evil, and the tongue can no man tame. And if a man can't tame his own tongue, no one else can tame it. And so they don't even want the Lord governing their speech. We read again, Second Peter, back to Peter, 2 and verse 10. Let them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. It's those that despise government. Well... I'm almost sympathetic sometimes when I think of some of the foolish things government does, and I just despise that. But what we're talking about here is they don't want any authority. They don't want anybody telling them anything what to do. They don't want anything to be governed, and they don't even govern themselves. And it goes on and say, presumptuous are they, self-willed, and they're not afraid to speak the evil of dignities. There's just some things you need to be careful about how you talk about that. And the dignities here probably have to do with government officials. But there's other things that are holding or dignified. Have you ever noticed how that sometime when men want to curse, not only do they choose unwholesome words, but then they draw God's name into their curse. They're speaking evil things they ought to speak of in a, in a manner that is dignified. So beware the words of men. But believe the words of God. Look at verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. There's nothing tainted there. There's no double meaning there. There's nothing corrupt there. He is giving you the words of truth and of righteousness. When you, when you hear the words of God, you can believe those words. 
The words of the Lord are tried words. It's silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You can put God's word to the test. You can prove all things. That means you can take the, the word of God, you can put it to the test and prove that is the word, that is the truth. That's the way it ought to be. There's a poem that reminded me of that you may have heard. It's about the blacksmith. Last eve I passed beside the blacksmith door and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime. And looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn and beaten with years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers? So just one, said he. Then said with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought of the anvil of God's word for ages. Skeptics' blows have beat upon. Yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil's unharmed. The hammers are gone. God's word can go through the trial. Put it in the furnace. Let it go through seven times. It'll come out pure. And you'll see it for what it is. You can believe God's words. You can believe the word of God. They're kept. God's words are kept words. And you might think of this, in fact, to keeping the promise. You know people that don't keep their word. They'll say something, they won't do it. And that, that's certainly part of this. God's going to keep his word. If he tells you something, you can count on it and he'll follow through with it. He is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But it's also kept here in the sense of it is guarded and it is preserved. Look what else it says. O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Words of the Lord endure. They are here and they're going to be here and they're going to continue to be here. They're preserved. Let's go back to Peter again. This time, 1 Peter 1, 22 through 23, how we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth. And the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Take that for the words of men. All the words of men. Well, they're like the grass. No weather. They'll fall. They'll fail. But God's word faileth not. It lives and abides forever. And then Peter said, this is the word of the gospel that was preached unto you. You know what that tells me? See, it's, it's through the preaching of the gospel we're begotten again. The gospel in our heart that brings us new life and gives us salvation in the Lord. That's kept and changed. That Peter said this. This is the same Peter that preached on the day of Pentecost. When he stood up there on the day of Pentecost and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises to you and your children, all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now that hadn't changed. That's the same It was true in Peter. That's the same today. And so we need to preach the same plan of salvation that Peter preached. It doesn't change with changing times. Listen, God's Word is not trying to keep up with us. It'll let us go our own way. Well, we got to do a stop and look back and listen to what it says govern ourselves accordingly. One more verse. One more verse. I went right over this one, but this is right in the middle of the psalm. Verse 5. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, 
Now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. You know who that is, who's puffing at him. You, you just think about that. Somebody just, you've probably seen this. Somebody just, oh, poof, poof. You know, like, what does that count? That's no good. That, it's a despairing thing. Isn't it puff is at him? And who's he puffing at? The poor and the needy. This is talking about men now. Now, you beware of the words of men and the men puffing at those that they think are lower than them. But what does God do? He knows about the poor. He knows about the needy. And for those speaking proud things, he'll cut off their lips and cut out their tongue. But he brings safety to the poor and needy. There's a great day coming. There's a great judgment day coming. When we'll all stand before God, and you don't want to stand before him proud. You don't want to be one of those puff adders puffing at them and speaking proud. You won't speak proud things on that day. Flattery will get you nowhere when that day comes. When that day comes, we want to be on the, in that group of the poor and of the needy and those that know that they need this Lord, that they need this salvation. The Lord will set us in safety if that's who's, where, where we are. And so with that, I'll extend the invitation. Don't let men tell you what to do to be saved. I'll tell you what men will say. I've heard this over and over and over. They'll say, you want to be saved? You want to be saved? <laughs> Except Christ is your personal Savior. Well, you don't find that in this book. Well, we'll, we'll pray the sinner's prayer. You've heard that? Well, as best people say, you ought to read something about it. It's not in the book. You beware the words of men, but believe the words of God. Repent and be baptized. That's what God's word says. And if that's what you'll do, then respond to the invitation as we stand and sing.